you know, so just for recapping, since this is nano day, when we began approximately 15 years ago, the prediction was made by somebody from Merrill Lynch that about twice a century we find a new technology that's introduced that um, leads to a paradigm change. And the question when nano came along was, well, is this going to be the 21st century technology? What happened beyond that was amazing in terms of people being able to make a toolbox of nanomaterials. Um, the prediction that nano will therefore come out and um, provide a lot of uh, loose standing manufacturing actually um, was so transformative that making all these structures of nanoparticles, nanotubes, quantum dots, we heard about gravity now, quickly evolved into intermediary products that was made and quickly evolved into nano-enabled products where nano was not just loose standing, but with other converging technologies, bio, nano, info, cogno, whole new um, industries were created. In fact, the growth of the whole sector of the three-dimensional periodic tables and the materials genome, when um, I did some work uh, for the um, uh, President's Council on projecting where this is going to end up, actually was difficult to isolate nano, but the combined effect of nano with the other uh, converging technologies uh, by 2018 will grow to a $3.5 trillion uh, industry. And the conceptualization then of things like the digital technology with the advent of nano manufacturing that has taken off and enabled this will lead to a new outcome and a new economic growth spurt. So, I'll say briefly something that out of the entire discovery, you've now seen a lot of the physical, chemical uh, stuff, is that there's also for where nano meets the rubber, uh, as far as biology is concerned, nanomaterials in the presence of biological media quickly adapt those biological media so that around a nanoparticle, a protein corona will form, and that this will create physical chemical interactions that lead this nanoparticle, amongst others, to be taken up and wrapped into different cellular compartments, and then dependent on their properties will lead them through a journey through the cell where you can influence, for instance, the function of intracellular uh, organelles such as uh, the lysosome. And just as a sort of a brief explanation, this is a cancer cell, seeing a silicon nano rod as compared to the same cancer cell seeing a silica sphere. And just this slight change in the material uh, aspect ratio means that this cell you will also see, seeing the rod is a lot more active. It's just a lot, a lot of these little spikes on the surface compared to seeing the sphere. And this shows the power of nano where detecting the length scale around these rods where it binds to the surface, where silica, silanol groups interact with biological groups, is enough that the cell can measure the length of these uh, uh, signals and being able at the cell membrane to trigger little small motor proteins that rearranges the cytoskeleton so that the actin cytoskeleton, seeing the rod you may not be able to see it at this light intensity, but you see all these little spikes standing up. It's these little uh, features that you see here, which is a cell process known as pinocytosis. And macropinocytosis takes in the rod into the cancer cell a lot faster with the spheres, where the actin cytoskeleton does not receive this motor input and lies down flat. So you can imagine the impact that this has on being able to develop that, for instance, as a drug delivering nano carrier. So the field of nanotechnology and medicine has introduced, therefore, an engineered approach to medicine, which now allows novel levels 
of screening, diagnosis, and treatment, for instance, at screening, we change low sensitivity in established disease where you look for single biomarker in an untimed fashion. You have to go to the clinic to a screening technology that's a million times more sensitive. You can detect things now at disease inception. You have labs on chips being able to monitor many different biomarkers. And you can do it real time and continuous. Um, so that also at the size of diagnosis, you, instead of having macro scale imaging and invasive procedures such as surgery done in a doctor's office, you can now image structure and function the whole body and it can be done with a lot of technology that can be performed at home and on the treatment side instead of surgery, radiation, debilitating chemo, we now have targeted drug delivery, imageable drug delivery, and engineered access uh, to disease sites. So I'll show you one example then of what is happening here in CNSI, where we have nanocancer as one of our therapeutics, where compared to a classical drug, the delivery of chemotherapeutic, we have very little control over them, other than that they kill the cancer, they have high toxicity, they go everywhere, your hair falls out, you develop anemia and bone marrow abnormalities, but with a nano drug, you can package it, you can control the delivery, you can grow across barriers, you can have multiple drugs that are combined, you can image and deliver, and you can decrease toxicity. And so from what Jeff had told us earlier on, teams of scientists then being able to work on this enabling technology as one group, the UCLA multidisciplinary pancreas cancer team, uh, we've assembled a group that has figured out that, you know, pancreas cancer, deadly, very few people walk away from it, actually is protected by a stroma, uh, which is a, like a dense capsule that does not allow anything through because the blood vessels where they are supposed to have structures that leak for instance, drugs and nanoparticles, is exactly the opposite. Everything is contained, and therefore there's a lot of resistance. We now establish a human pancreas cancer in a mouse, a little operation. We have a cancer cell that we implant, put it back. The animal then develops pancreas cancer tumor, which we can image. It metastasizes. Here is the primary tumor surrounding organs. And we now come in with one of the pancreas cancer drugs at the moment, potent, but it's very toxic. And so as one formulation, um, nanocarrier, a liposome, which is basically a lipid bilayer, uh, entrapping a space in which you can deliver the arena fecan, um, have been upscaled by making nanoparticles. In this case now, we make a liposome lookalike also has a lipid bilayer, but the inferior contains the equivalent of uh, Swiss cheese in the form of uh, silica, mesoporous silica nanoparticles, where against these walls with Conneval's uh, electrostatic forces, we can pump in a lot more drugs. Moreover, the particle is more stable, and the outcome we look now, so here's the pancreas cancer, it's metastases. Here's the free arena fecan, changes very little. With the liposome, which is on the market, changes very little. With the silicosome, there is uh, almost total eradication of the primary tumor. The metastases disappear, and there's a 25% survival. And if you now want to follow, how do the particles get into that a tumor site across this very thick uh, uh, cortex of a um, uh, thick layer um, stroma. Actually, one of the routes that the cancer can feed itself with all these stringencies is to make use of blood vessels that have an import system in the form of vesicles. We also call it a transcytosis process. And then Amazingly, making use of this mechanism where these vesicles 
occasionally appear and allow particles to go into the cancer site is we now use a peptide that turns on a signal that pumps in more of these transcytotic vesicles over time. You can see a lot of them. And if you label your particles with a metal four, we can now see that indeed we can transgress across this barrier by taking particles from the lumen into the interstitium of the tumor. And this is a dying tumor cell where these particles are in the seronuclear distribution with a dramatic in uh, increase in improval. Another example then of taking this um, a paradigm forward is we can now say, okay, with chemotherapy, we can intervene, we can get uh, new outcomes. But if we ask the question of what the ultimate cure is for cancer is not chemotherapy, but that is the immune system, and there's a lot of exciting stuff now happening around the immunology of tumors, where from dying cancer cells, infiltration of dendritic cells and elements of the immune system, and then processing of the immunological stimuli at the regional lymph node is undergoing a revolution with the treatment of so-called checkpoint inhibitors. These are antibodies that twig the immune system locally and in the lymph node to turn things that the tumor turns off to turn the immune system back on with an amazing outcome. But the success only reaches about 20% of people. Uh, the rest of the people do not benefit uh, from the treatment. We now ask the question, well, since we can deliver the chemotherapy so successfully, can we deliver the chemotherapy to make sense in terms of making the tumor immunogenic? And from all the chemotherapy drugs, most of them kill tumors by a process of cell death known as apoptosis, which is non-immunogenic. But a small number of chemotherapeutic agents do induce a form of apoptosis, which is also immunogenic, known as immunogenic cell death. And the net effect of then taking cognition of that, we found one chemotherapeutic agent for pancreas cancer, which if we deliver it to pancreatic cancer cells, we inject the pancreatic cancer cells in one flank of an animal, and then wait a, uh, two weeks, and then come back with a pancreas cancer on the opposite end, you get an immunogenic cell death, then this tumor will, if it is a non-immunogenic stimulus, such as chemotherapy A, this cancer will grow. But if the initial insult, so chemotherapy B, which we discovered for pancreas cancer, induces an immune signal, look what will happen now. Tumor here uh, with saline grows. There's no immune event. Chemotherapy A fails. The tumor grows. You get a big tumor. But chemotherapy B, which induces immunogenic cell death, there is failure of tumor growth. So you can now vaccinate and prevent the cancer growing. And then if you also take turn the paradigm around and you go to an already growing pancreatic tumor, such as I've shown you earlier on, saline treatment, no effect. Chemo A, no effect. Chemo B, deliver as a nanocarrier so that you get this drug at high amount to the pancreas cancer, wipes out most of these cancers. You deliver the chemo B as a free drug in the blood. This doesn't happen. So the encapsulation is successful. How much? Uh, two more minutes? Okay. So the rest of the story is then also that in the work that we're doing, the biology is very important. You've seen the quest for energy as it currently exists. Is the uh, implication for nano, which is very powerful, to keep it safe. And where we have developed, therefore, here at UCLA, one of the world's most uh, forward-looking centers for screening nanomaterial safety. 
by the cellular nanobio interface. We've developed methods to do it high throughput and to be able to therefore screen a large number of materials and therefore uh, the quest of nano, keeping it safe, keeping it with converging materials is likely to have a big impact then um, on our uh, future sojourn on this planet in terms of not only uh, tricking the scenarios but being able uh, to intervene um, to give us the knowledge and the know-how how to go forward. Thank you.